In Protestant countries, the political authorities were very important in implementing the ideas of Luther, Calvin, and the rest. In fact, in some respects, the Protestant movement would have been much more limited were it not for the impact of politicians and government leaders. Did political leaders also have this much influence in Catholic countries? Or could the Pope just dictate what was supposed to happen? What role did politicians play in helping Catholicism retain such a prominent place in Christianity? Nick, uh, it's absolutely the case that the political leaders uh, were as important for the Catholic Reformation as were political leaders for the Protestant Reformation. Uh, church officials, even popes, uh, could say everything they wanted to say about what should be done unless the uh, heads of Christian states, Catholic states, embraced what was said by popes and councils, uh, no changes uh, would be affected. Uh, you needed the leadership of a Christian state to implement uh, the kind of reforms that had been promulgated by Trent and by the reform-minded uh, papacy. Uh, in order to illustrate that truth, I'd, li I'd like to talk about uh, one such Catholic leader here in the 16th century, really the dominant political figure in uh, Europe uh, in the course of the 16th century. Uh, and that man is the King of Spain. Uh, his name is Philip II. Now, uh, Philip was the son and heir of Charles V. Uh, but you'll recall that when Charles V uh, basically gave up being emperor and king and so forth, he, he really divided uh, his uh, empire into two halves. Uh, half for his son and another part for his brother. It was his brother Ferdinand who became emperor and uh, ruler of the Habsburg uh, territories in Austria and uh, places around Austria in Germany. Uh, Philip, on the other hand, the son, uh, really received the much uh, wealthier and more prosperous part of uh, Charles's uh, domains. He became not only king of Spain, uh, but also ruler of other territories in Europe, uh, like uh, the Netherlands, uh, a very prosperous part of Europe, uh, there in the northern part of Europe at the mouth of the Rhine River uh, near the North Sea and so forth. Uh, also, uh, parts of Italy uh, came into uh, Philip's hands. Uh, he also uh, was the heir of the overseas Spanish Empire, which is in, was in the process of being built up over the course of the 16th century. So that uh, Philip at his disposal uh, resources uh, from not just Europe, but from uh, other parts of the world, and was a very wealthy and powerful individual. Of course, if you rule a lot of territories, you also have a lot of responsibilities. So it wasn't simply a matter of enjoying uh, the monarchy. In fact, in Philip's case, it was a matter of working very hard at that uh, monarchy. And that's one of the things that we want to note about uh, Philip, uh, is that he had a, uh, a strong character, uh, was dedicated to his, his job, worked the very long hours uh, as king and ruler of this kind of far-flung empire that he possessed. We also want to note about Philip uh, that he was a very dedicated uh, Catholic, very much dedicated to uh, the Catholic religion, uh, as a result of which he was a strong opponent of uh, Protestantism. Uh, this meant that in his own territories like Spain, uh, he was a strong supporter of Catholic authorities and kind of working to snuff out heresy wherever it might appear. And, Actually, Spain remained a very strong Catholic country. It's probably the strongest Catholic country in the period, the backbone, really, of the, of the Catholic Reformation, of the Counter-Reformation. It also meant that uh, Philip uh, was willing uh, to use his resources uh, to uh, suppress and to fight a Protestantism in other, other places. So, for example, uh, Philip uh, backed uh, the Catholic side in the wars of religion in France during the second half of the 16th century. 
Uh, and this, he thought, was a part of his obligation as a Christian prince or a Christian ruler. Uh, the true religion, the true church, needed to be defended uh, and advanced, and he, as a Christian ruler, was in a position uh, to do that. Now, uh, one of the places within his uh, empire that uh, political and religious questions really came to the fore in combination and that resulted in conflict uh, was in the Netherlands. Now, the Netherlands historically uh, consisted of 17 different little territories. We talk about the 17 provinces of the Netherlands. Uh, by the late Middle Ages, uh, they had come to be ruled all by the same uh, feudal uh, nobleman, uh, somebody who, for want of a better term, we can call the Duke of uh, Burgundy, and then uh, the, the Dukes of Burgundy had married into the House of Habsburg. By the time we get to Charles V, uh, the, Nether the Netherlands territories uh, are all ruled by the Habsburgs, that is, the Emperor Charles V, and then they passed along to uh, Philip II. Uh, but they have their own history, their own traditions, and their own laws. Uh, and one of the things that they very quickly came to resent about their king, uh, Philip, was that he seemed to be more interested in the Spanish part of his domain than he was in the Netherlands part. Uh, he appointed, for example, Spaniards as high officials uh, within the uh, Netherlands. And then he sought to implement uh, policies, uh, both tax policies and church policies, uh, that uh, seem to contradict uh, kind of the traditions and the rights uh, and privileges of the peoples and especially the leaders uh, in, the, in the Netherlands. Uh, so fairly early uh, in, his, in his reign, uh, he began to have some problems in the Netherlands. Now, Philip himself uh, was not uh, personally uh, present. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't visit the Netherlands after... Uh, 1559, so he had to put into place uh, others who would kind of rule and exercise authority in his name. And, and early in his reign, uh, the regent there in the Netherlands uh, was a relative, uh, Margaret, Margaret of uh, Parma. And she was, uh, she was concerned about the measure of disobedience that she was seeing to uh, Philip's policies in the Netherlands. Uh, as a result of which, one of her advisors is supposed to have said, what, madam, don't concern yourself with these beggars, kind of dismissing the opposition then as beggars, in spite of the fact that it included some of the great nobility of the Netherlands. Well, when word of this came to the opponents, they adopted uh, the name beggar uh, as a sign of their uh, rebellion. So beggars came to be known as the name for the rebels against Philip. Uh, in the Netherlands. Now, as I indicated, this had a strong political component, and all during uh, the reign of Philip II, uh, those in the Netherlands who resisted his policies, resisted his rule, uh, could be doing it uh, for simply political reasons. So that is, it was a battle for their liberties, the old liberties that they had enjoyed prior to the reign of Philip II. And that meant uh, Catholics as well as Protestants uh, could, uh, could be a part of that rebellion. Uh, but it was also true that there was a strong religious component. Uh, and in the Netherlands, in the second half of the 16th century, Protestantism was growing stronger and stronger, especially in its reformed uh, variety. So here, as we have seen elsewhere, France, uh, Scotland uh, particularly, uh, reformed Protestantism uh, participated in a rebellion uh, against, uh, against monarchs, against, uh, against political authorities. Uh, it was probably 1566 that the religious elements started to come to the fore. In the summer of 1566, uh, Protestants uh, basically uh, went on the rampage uh, against Catholic practice and Catholic uh, piety uh, in something that we call iconoclastic uh, riots in which uh, statues are destroyed, uh, 
stained glass was destroyed, consecrated hosts uh, were destroyed. Um, the, the things, the material things that were an essential part of Catholic worship became the object of hatred and destruction by Protestants uh, throughout the Netherlands, but especially, especially in Antwerp. Uh, when word of this came back to uh, Philip, he uh, uh, decided to take uh, strong measures. And he sent, as governor of the Netherlands, uh, one of his uh, strong advisors, a good military man, the Duke of Alva, uh, and he brought with him a Spanish army. And they sought to impose obedience uh, to the Catholic Church and the King of Spain uh, by means of force. Uh, to that end, uh, the, the, the ruler set up a special a judicial commission uh, that Protestants nicknamed the Council of Blood uh, because it went after uh, many people, in fact thousands of people, were put to death uh, by this council as rebels against, against the king. Uh, well, obviously this is going to have uh, some effect, uh, but it proved impossible uh, actually to suppress the rebellion entirely. Uh, for one thing, a leader emerged who continued to kind of rally the people behind the rebellion. Uh, this was a, a nobleman from the Netherlands. His name was William, and his family uh, was Orange. So this is William of Orange, and eventually the House of Orange uh, would produce uh, the kings of the Netherlands, but that's long time uh, in the future. But really here we have its, uh, kind of its origin as a special dynasty uh, among, the, among the people of the Netherlands. So William of Orange emerged as uh, their great leader. Sometimes he's called in history William the Silent, and that's apparently because for some period of time he was silent about his religion, uh, and wisely so because he wanted as broad a base of support for the rebellion as he could, uh, could obtain. Uh, the other thing that's noteworthy about the rebellion and why it was not fully suppressed was the fact that uh, the, Dutch, uh, the Dutch, particularly uh, on, the, on the coast, uh, were uh, good seamen. And they could uh, function as kind of uh, pirates or a navy, you know, whichever term you prefer, against the Spanish and the Spanish uh, shipping. Uh, they were known as the sea beggars. And they proved a continuing uh, thorn in the side of Philip as he tried to uh, suppress, suppress the rebellion. Uh, it's also true that uh, the English uh, were willing to provide some aid and some help uh, to the rebellion. Uh, it's uh, also true that there were even uh, some efforts from the French in that, same, in, in that same direction. Well, for a variety of factors then, uh, Philip was unable to suppress uh, the course of the rebellion. And as a matter of fact, at one point, it looked as, as, as if he was going to lose the entire, entire prov province. Uh, but at length, he found a man, uh, the Duke of uh, Parma, actually another member of the Farnese family, uh, who was not only a good military man, uh, but also a skilled uh, diplomat. And in the uh, 1580s, the Duke of Parma uh, actually uh, defeated some of the rebellious forces, especially in the southern part of the Netherlands. Uh, the city of Antwerp uh, was uh, taken uh, by the forces of Philip. And uh, those southern provinces uh, were basically kept under, under Spanish rule. Uh, it proved impossible, however, uh, for Parma uh, to gather much success in the northern part of the Netherlands, the northern seven uh, provinces. This is where the Dutch people uh, lived. And it was in this period uh, that the Dutch began to exploit their abilities on the seas, actually developing uh, a, a commercial and uh, trading uh, empire by the course of the 17th century, uh, upon which they would ultimately become one of the wealthiest uh, parts of Europe. Uh, and Amsterdam 
uh, would become uh, one of the largest, most important uh, cities in Europe. Well, they were able to use uh, their resources uh, not only on the seas, but also to actually hire soldiers uh, to continue uh, fighting against, against the uh, forces of Philip II. Uh, the English, as I mentioned before, were also supportive of the rebellion. Uh, you recall when we talked about Elizabeth, uh, one of the things that Philip tried to do in the 1580s was to knock the English out of the war uh, by sending the uh, Spanish Armada. And eventually what he wanted to do was to send his fleet to, through the English Channel they would pick up the army of Parma, take it over to England, defeat the English, and so knock the English out of the war. Uh, as we discussed previously, that didn't happen. Uh, the Spanish Armada was defeated, and that meant that um, uh, the war would continue in the Netherlands the way it had before, and therefore uh, the forces of Spain never could defeat those northern seven uh, provinces. When Philip uh, died in 1598, uh, the rebellion was still ongoing. Uh, it was only uh, under his son, Philip III, uh, that a truce uh, was finally agreed to in 1609. Um, by that time, it was becoming pretty clear that the Netherlands were going to be in two sections. Uh, and in point of fact, Spanish rule persisted in the south uh, for more than a century, and that southern part of the Netherlands uh, would eventually, in the 19th century, uh, become uh, the country of Belgium, and it would remain uh, Catholic. As far as the North was concerned, however, uh, the North would eventually win its independence. Uh, the North's war for independence would continue after the truce and become a part of the Thirty Years' War, but finally, in 1648, uh, the independence of the North uh, was recognized. Uh, we call them the United Provinces or the, or the Dutch Republic. Uh, and although there were a lot of different religions represented among the Dutch people, uh, it was the Reformed faith uh, that actually became uh, the state, state religion. So uh, the revolt of the Netherlands uh, was a failure uh, from the standpoint of uh, Philip. He was unable to keep the Netherlands in his domain. He was unable to keep the Northern Netherlands as a part of the Catholic uh, Church. Now, many, in many respects, uh, Philip's foreign adventures were failures. Uh, his side did not win in France. Uh, he wasn't able to defeat the English. Uh, the Dutch uh, earned their independence. Uh, so, in many respects, his foreign policy was a failure. Uh, but there was one place in which it was a, uh, a, a powerful success, and that was in the, in the Mediterranean. Because still another problem that Philip had to address was the problem of Turkish advances uh, from the east into the western part of the Mediterranean. Uh, the Turks were a strong power, and they had advanced up the Danube River uh, taking off chunks of land like uh, Hungary and placing that under a Turkish rule, uh, but they also advanced in the Mediterranean. Well, it was in 1571 that the combined forces of Spain and Venice uh, and the papacy and even, even the empire, uh, those forces under the leadership of uh, Philip's uh, brother, um, Don, Don Juan, uh, actually defeated uh, the naval forces of the, of the Turks in the Battle of Lepanto, which is kind of off, just, just off the coast of Greece, uh, in one of the decisive battles uh, between uh, the Turks and Western Christendom in these years. And that kind of stopped the advance of the Turks in the Mediterranean. And so that was an important success, a foreign policy success during the reign of Philip II. And, of course, it had important religious overtones in the fact that the Muslims, therefore, uh, would basically be kept in the eastern part of the Mediterranean instead of expanding even, even further west. Uh, in short, then, uh, Philip II's reign is characterized by a great deal of uh, conflict, uh, much of it uh, based uh, in Reformation and uh, religious issues. Uh, Philip II 
uh, using uh, the resources of the monarchy uh, to advance and to defend the interests of the Catholic Church. So he's really a great example of what we mean by the dependence of even the Catholic Church upon the rulers of, of Christendom.